In this episode of the Latino Business Report, we have a candid conversation with Eddie Aldrete. Eddie has been named one of the top 100 figures in Texas politics and government and one of the most influential people in San Antonio. He is a senior vice president of IBC Bank and has been a longtime advocate for Dreamers and the DACA program. Since recording this episode, there's been a lot of activity on Capitol Hill. The House has passed the Dream and Promise Act of 2021, and the Senate is considering a Dream Act of their own. Both houses are negotiating vigorously on the pros and cons. Even though close to 80% of the American public would like to see Dreamers have a pathway to citizenship, it seems like some of our legislators still have issues. It is our hope that both houses can reach some sort of compromise and that the Dreamers will finally get a pathway to citizenship and a place to call home. Welcome to the Latino Business Report. This podcast covers business, people, and issues of the day from a Latino perspective. The Latino Business Report is brought to you by TAMAC, the Texas Association of Mexican-American Chambers of Commerce. TAMAC is the leading Hispanic business organization in Texas since 1975. Now for your host, J.R. Gonzalez. And welcome back. Today's guest is Eddie Alderete. With, uh, he's a senior vice president of IBC Bank. Eddie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, J.R. Glad to be here today. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for being here, sir. But uh, you're a vice president of a bank, but we're not going to talk about banking today. We're going to talk about the dreamers. Eddie, let's let's start off. Let's just dive right into this thing. How did you get involved or how did you get involved into to the advocacy for for these dreamers? Well, it's part personal and part business. You know, on the on the personal side, you see it's a problem that has existed for decades. And on the business side, uh, working for a border based bank, we're um, located just five blocks from the Rio Grande here in Laredo. And it's an issue that we see and live and experience every single day. And every time we would hear people talk about the issue, we would hear people say certain things and we would start researching it and and trying to verify what they were saying. And it's like an onion. You know, you find something and you peel a layer away and then, hey, look at that. And then you delve a little deeper and you pull another layer away. And before you know it, you're down to the core. And uh, we've discovered a lot during this process. When we're talking about dreamers, just for the edification, everybody out there, what is a dreamer? A a dreamer is somebody that uh, is out of status and uh, was brought here uh, through no fault of their own and uh, most likely at a very young age where they couldn't make their own decision. They were brought by parents or other family members. So they're out of status and they are seeking some sort of status, whether that's um, a permanent resident or whether it is eventually getting on the path to citizenship. So they're not citizens uh, and they're out of status, meaning uh, they don't have authorization to be in the country. So as a out-of-status person, realistically, they could be deported at any time, could they not? Yes, they could. Um, You know, we've had uh, under uh, President Obama and uh, to some extent under President Trump, uh, there's been a general consensus that the best thing to do is to focus on the criminals and the felons and the people who mean us harm. And if somebody is working as a construction worker um, and they're minding their own business and they're paying taxes and um, they're filling a job that might not be filled otherwise, then the general consensus has been, well, leave them be until we can resolve their status issue. But that's not always been the case, has it? (laughs) It It has not always been the case. I mean, we're all familiar with people who are driving down the road, um, they've got a blinker out, they get pulled over, issued a citation, the officer, trooper, deputy discovers uh, that they're out of status, and then they're taken back and um, 
the law enforcement agency calls ICE and um, they share and coordinate information. And before you know it, that person is uh, put in process for deportation. That's a shame. Let's, let's paint the picture a little bit, Eddie, for, for some of it, for people out there. We're talking if a, a child, maybe two, three years old, parents cross into the U.S. undocumented, that child is brought with them. They come to the United States as an early age. They start school. They go through the program. They know nothing else. This is their, this is their home. They grow up. They get older, they go to school, they work, they're here. But yet, up until the Obama administration, they'd be, they'd be kind of living in the shadows, correct? And then Obama kind of said there's some sort of reprieve here for these dreamers. And the, with the, what was the DACA program? It was the DACA, the Deferred uh, Action uh, Program uh, that we call as DACA today. And uh, this allowed people to get into this temporary status because it was created by executive order and not legislatively. So it's not permanent. So when Trump came in, um, you know, he wanted to do away with it. And um, now here we are with President Biden. And the goal is to um, legalize their status and Close to 80% of the American people support a permanent solution for DACA recipients. And it has overwhelming, it's about 77, 78% uh, support, bipartisan support across the country uh, for these um, um, DACA. Uh, sometimes we for use the dreamers. The, yes, the, we use the word kids, DACA kids, yeah. but uh, many of them are adults. Many of them are adults that are. <sighs> active parts of society. I mean, they're, they're, some are, you know, we got doctors, we got first line responders, we got all kinds of people that are these dreamers or under the protection of DACA. But at any time, since, as you said, it's temporary, there's always that possibility that they could lose that status and, and be deported. Absolutely. You know, there's a great example of a 44 year old city councilwoman in California who um, grew up in California all her life? One of her a little, one of her political opponents began uh, looking into her past because he didn't like her politics, and he somehow discovered um, that she was out of status. So um, they called ICE, and ICE began the process of deporting her to Mexico a country she had no memory of, a language that she didn't speak, and a country that she never remembers being in. Um, so she grew up thinking she was born in the United States and that she was a U.S. citizen. Uh, she obviously Hispanic, but um, spoke little to no Spanish. And um, here, you know, and this was not this is not the intention of the American people as to how this program should work or how any of these programs to work. Um, the challenge that we have in the country, JR, is that people say, why can't they come here legally? And the challenge is the current immigration system that we have is so Byzantine um, that it, it's difficult to get anything done. Now, to really solve this problem, you have to go back to understand the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is this. For a functioning economy, you either have to create your own human capital or import your human capital. And in the United States, we are doing neither. We are not creating our human capital because we're not having enough children to replace ourselves or sustain ourselves as a population. So it takes 2.1 births per adult female to sustain a population in the United States today, we're at 1.76. If you look at my family, my father was one of 11 children from Del Rio, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was one of 11 children from Brownsville, Texas. Um, when they got married, they had five children. So I'm one of five. My wife is one of five and we have three. So you can see the inverted pyramid and if you understand the time frame in which those 11 children were born during the Depression um, and where we are today in our society, then you quickly come to the conclusion that during the Depression, children were a profit center. 
and today they're a cost center. So they were a profit center because um, that was more hands that could work for free on the family farm. It was more um, labor that could work in, in the case of my father's family, the family owned grocery store. And everybody in my father's family, all the siblings, whenever they brought home money from working, they put it into a coffee can and that's what they used to feed themselves and um, to function. So we're not having children in this country because we're only having 1.7 uh, children per adult female when we should be at 2.1. And we're not importing our human capital because we have an immigration system that doesn't work. Now, Eddie, when you say we're not having children, you're talking pretty much, I mean, that's not necessarily the case with the, with the Hispanic or Latino community, because we're, I mean, from 2000 to 2010, 57% of this country's population growth was directly attributed to the Latino community. So Latinos are still having kids, but non Latinos are not having them as much. So it was what, like a zero population growth amongst non-Hispanic whites. Non-Hispanic whites are below replacement level, African-Americans below replacement level, Asian-Americans below replacement level, and um, Hispanics uh, were a couple years ago at about 2.3. We'll get a better idea um, with the, when the new census data comes in in a couple of months. Okay. So, and I'm following you here. It's also important to know that I think the average age of of the Latino in this country is about 26, 27 years old, where non-Hispanic whites are, what, 40, 45, maybe even up to 50 average age? If you look at an age chart for the state of Texas, for example, you're going to see a chart that looks like the letter X. So um, on the on the lower left-hand corner where the beginning of the line for Hispanics that goes up to the upper right-hand corner um, the average age of Hispanic Texans is very young. And the one for the uh, non-Hispanic whites, um, the average age is very old. They are literally aging off of the life chart. Um, and it's become a real issue. And it's an economic issue because a corporation or a nation um, they are both built on foundations of growth. And if you're not growing, then you're dying. And that's what's happening. And you know what? Let me use Mexico as an example, <clears throat> because too many Americans have this impression uh, that Mexican families are having seven kids. That was the case in 1960. The average Mexican female was the fertility rate for a uh, Mexican female was 7.0 in 1960. So that meant they were having seven children. Today it's 2.0. So even Mexico is below the replacement level. And ironically, one of the key um, issues that has driven down the Mexican fertility rate is novelas. Um, Wait, back up, novelas? Novelas, because okay. a lot of the and this has been this this has been backed up by by research and fact, but a lot of the Mexican families were watching novelas and realizing that the wealthy people only had two or three kids and not five or six kids. And so a lot of <clears throat> families decided, well, I guess the way to wealth is having fewer children. So, um, you know, they they ended up having fewer children. But Mexico competes with the United States for Guatemalan farm workers. Um, the people who are coming across are more likely to be Central American than they are Mexican. And we do have now a, um, a, a net um, gain of zero, um, for lack of a better phrase, for the number of people who come from Mexico and the number of people who are Mexicans in the United States that turn around and go back home. Well, we, we've been at that zero bubble for several years now. I mean, what, eight, nine years, yeah. almost 10. Uh, <clears throat> so, yes. So we're talking a population that, you know, you hear it on the streets, go back to where you come from. You know, we don't want you here, but actually the, the Hispanic population growth in the U S isn't due to immigration. It's just due 
due to natural births and the fact that we have a younger population, a childbearing population, and also Hispanics are taking a bulk of the, the jobs out there. I mean, we're a strong workforce, Eddie. So how come people don't understand the basic economics of that and the need? It's, it, 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 you're right. It is fairly basic economics. Um, you do have the Hispanic demographic group is, has the highest labor participation rate of any demographic group in the United States. And, you know, it, it, um, it's a constant struggle. You know, this issue has been talked about, debated, uh, discussed, fought over, um, for decades, the last major immigration reform package that passed was uh, the 1986 Act, which uh, President Ronald Reagan signed into law. Well, in, in 19, basically what Reagan did was allowed uh, amnesty, wasn't it? Well, yes. Yeah, so what he did was he did not solve the second half of the equation. Um he did provide amnesty, but he did not fix the problem for the future flow um, of people as to how they would come in. I mean, look at it this way. Um, when Bill Gates was running Microsoft, you know, he was saying we should be stapling a, gr a green card to the diplomas of these people who are getting coming into the United States and they're getting a Ph.D. in science, technology, engineering and math. And if you think of where do immigrants compete with Americans, it's like the letter U. So on one end of the U, if, if you dropped out of elementary school or dropped out of middle school or high school and you're working as a janitor or a hotel worker, you're probably going to compete with an immigrant. And the other end of the U is if you have a PhD in science, technology, engineering and math, chances are you're probably going to compete with an immigrant, you know, for a job. But everybody else uh, in the middle doesn't really compete with immigrants. True. I don't see a lot of uh, non-Hispanic whites lining up to go out in the fields and under that hot Texas or California sun and picking those crops. I mean, nobody wants to do that. And we're dependent on that labor force to get those crops picked. Yeah. And the reality is that, you know, when I grew up, um, I, I had had 10 to 12 jobs by the time I went off to college. And that included everything from mowing lawns, raking leaves, uh, babysitting the, the friends of my younger brothers, uh, who didn't want a girl babysitter, uh, and delivering a newspaper, um, working at a, a a, um, I mean, a, a drugstore. Um, I mean, you name it. I sold flower seeds. I did whatever I could to earn money um, to buy my 10 speed bicycle or to save money for college. I did whatever I could. And we don't have that as much today because the more educated you become and the wealthier you become, um, the fewer children you tend to have. And so those children grow up in a nicer lifestyle. So they're less likely to want to work in a fast food restaurant um, or to work as a waiter or waitress. And so it's a challenge that we face in society. And as a society progresses, um, you know, you're finding Mexico, a lot of people have moved up to the middle class and they don't want to do farm work anymore. So the Guatemalans are saying, well, hey, we need work. We'll come in and, and do that work for you. Um, Colombia has had a major infusion of Venezuelans who are making themselves available to pick the coffee beans. And Colombians are saying, you know what? We used to do that and we want something better. We want an indoor job where there's air conditioning or we want this kind of job. And so as any country or their economy progresses over time, um, the culture and people's attitude towards work changes as well. At least for me, there's a realization, and you take some of the European models, for example. A lot of those European countries had to open their doors to immigrants just to fill the need of a workforce. If they're not producing their own workforce, like you said, and it doesn't seem like the U.S. is either, they need those 
those bodies to go out there and do the work. And without that, the economy is going to crumble. The question I have, Eddie, is we're looking at it, and it's unfortunate that as people think of illegal aliens, and I hate that term, but undocumented workers, that they're almost demonizing the Latino community. It's like brown faces, brown, brown people. You see people crawling over fences. You see the things on television. Everything is Latino based in, in their depiction. But yet you have Canadians, you have Asians, you have Europeans that are coming over in droves. But since they kind of fit in a little bit more, nobody's pointing the finger at them. They're going, oh, you must, where are your papers? Are you here illegal? Or that a lot of them don't feel the same type of uh, discrimination or prejudice. So why is the media and the country seem to be pointing all its fingers towards the, towards the Latino community? I think it's for several reasons. Um, you know, I met someone who works in a, for a city in the state of Texas, a municipality, and he went to Mexico, uh, Mexico City, for a meeting. And when he came back, he called me up and he goes, oh, my God, what an amazing city. I mean, it has tall buildings and everything. And I'm like, what were you expecting? Uh, I mean, Mexico City is a metropolitan city. It's amazing. And he literally was expecting to see the old stereotype of, you know, people laying around with, um, you know, huaraches and sombreros taking a siesta under a palm tree. <laughs> and um, it's, it's just amazing to me that over time, you know, if you don't do your homework or you don't get out and about or you don't, you know, mingle in um, – circles where you get to travel and you get to see all these things, you just get this old stereotype that's stuck in your head. And Eddie, I, had, I need to apologize. When I when we started this, we jumped right into it and I didn't adequately introduce you. But besides being the senior vice president of a, of a bank, you've been involved in a lot of other organizations that deal with this issue. Can you give us kind of a rundown of some of the other uh, organizations you've been involved with as far as advocacy for this issue? Sure. Well, in 2011, I served as chair of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber. Um, and that's where I uh, actually had the previous year in 2010 is when I met Senator Lindsey Graham. And, um, you know, I asked him if he would be willing to come back to Texas and talk about immigration. And he took me up on my offer. And so in 2011, when I chaired this San Antonio Hispanic Chamber, he came down and 300 people came out to the luncheon. And, you know, he was very honest and and you know, when I thanked him for his leadership on the immigration issue, his response to me was, well, Eddie, you don't realize how hard it is. It's a lot easier to be for immigration reform in Texas. I have to deal with the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in my home state of South Carolina. So it takes a little more bravery uh, up in South Carolina. Then um, in December, I just ended a three-year term as chairman of the board for the National Immigration Forum. And uh, today I'm serving as a co-chair of the Texas Opportunity Coalition, which is a business group um, in support of a permanent fix to DACA. And I guess lastly, um, I'm also serving as the secretary of the board of the Texas Association of Business and uh, immigration reform and workforce related issues are a major part of our advocacy efforts at TAB. Well, you obviously have a passion for this. I do. And you know, what's funny is that I, my father was involved, um, you know, back in the uh, 70s. And I, after he passed away, I stumbled across some letters, um, love letters that he had written my mother leading up to the wedding in 1954. And because they didn't live in the same city until the day they got married. And in one of the letters, he's telling my mother you know, I've got to go because I've got to get ready for this congressman from Wisconsin. He's coming to San Antonio for a hearing because he swears that communists are coming across the southern border. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. You replace the word communist with terrorist. <laughs> and what's changed since Not the much. 1950s? Not much at all. You um, you mentioned Graham. Now, doesn't uh, what's the status of that Durbin Graham legislation that was introduced a while back? 
Well, actually, I, I had a great uh, sit down meeting with the senator today at a at a meeting in Florida, and um, we we talked about that. Um, he's a big believer. He's <clears throat> partnered with the uh, Democratic senator Dick Durbin, and uh, they believe they have a winning package. The challenge that they're facing is it's a little hard to talk about immigration reform when you're seeing this surge of caravans that are arriving on the Texas border, uh, because it's going to be hard for a lot of people to support immigration reform when they feel like, well, then we're, we already have this magnet and, you know, um, there are a lot of people, even on the democratic side that are upset that president Biden started lifting, you know, the, uh, the rules on asylum seekers, because they all felt like all of a sudden that's that was the signal, that was the starting pistol that people in Central and South America needed to start heading this way. And so now it's hard to have a rational conversation about immigration reform um, as long as these people are surging on the border coming across. No, that makes sense. Um I guess with a change of administration, the attitude is like, let's try to get in while we can get in. And there's there there are now there seems to be a lot more in those at one time the un what I considered the unreal caravans coming up. Now it looks like caravans are starting to form. Right. So it's not hard for the cartels or the the coyotes to look and say, This guy who's president was vice president to the to Barack Obama and Obama's the one that started the DACA program. So let's all, you know, he's going to be just like Obama. Let's start heading that way. And so you have a, a push pull phenomenon. That's the pull phenomenon. And the push part is either the cartels, you know, uh, threatening people and threatening families and pushing them out or the lack of economic opportunity uh, for people in some of these countries. And so um, it's very difficult for a lot of these people. And the reality is what we're seeing and what we continue to see um, and what's hard for people to differentiate is what percentage of these people are just coming to get in and what percentage of the people are coming across. They're, they're reported as total number of apprehensions. And I'm using air quotes. Okay. And I'm using air quotes because not everyone is technically apprehended. Uh, because a lot of these people are coming across and they're raising their hand and they're saying, hello, is Border Patrol here? I want to turn myself in because I want to seek asylum. Please arrest me. Yes. Um, but, you know, there's ways to do that, um, you know, legally. And, you know, we had the situation where, you know, Mexico didn't have its own Border Patrol on the southern border. And Trump put his foot down and he made Mexico do it. And Mexico did it, you know, to their credit. Um, but it's it's just very, very difficult now um, when you have this, it's like a tsunami. You just see this wave that's coming and water finds its own level. So they're going to come in through Brownsville or through Laredo or through El Paso. However they can get in, they're going to come in. I think it's interesting, Andy, that a lot of people that are watching news and hearing about this, I realized, oh my gosh, all these illegal folks are sneaking across our border and coming over here and taking our jobs. But a lot of the folks that are here undocumented, close to 50% of them came here legally. I mean, they came with visas, they came by airplane, they came by whatever, and just never went back and let their... They overstayed their visa and no no border wall can change that. Um, exactly. Because they, they did enter illegally. You're right. And I, and I make the point because as we're looking at this situation, it's just not about Guatemalans or Mexicans, you know, crossing a border. And as I said earlier, we have other countries that are, that are doing the same thing. The difficult part is for a comprehensive immigration reform. And you're right with the change administration on one end, it looks like maybe something is doable, but then on the other end with the uh, onslaught of people wanting to come to the U S which I don't, I mean, who doesn't want a better way of life? Who doesn't want, you know, their children to be more successful than they were? 
And unfortunately, and I was watching the news earlier where Congressman uh, Cuellar and, and Cornyn were visiting some uh, some detention centers full of kids and that right. there's a lot of folks just sending their kids. I mean, young pre-teenage kids, go, mijo, vaya con Dios, good luck, and, and try to start a better life. And if you get a chance, write me and just, you know, be safe. It's a shame it's come to that. It, re- it really is, where, where kids are escorting kids across the border in hopes of a, a, of a better way of life. And you're exactly right. And the reality is, you know, I'm not sure we're going to be able to make any sort of progress until we can do something with the economies um, down in the Northern Triangle of, of Guatemala and Honduras and uh, Nicaragua. Um, and to some extent, El Salvador. But, um, you know, we have to find ways to help them improve their economy so more people will stay. And that's what happened with Mexico. When Mexico's economy began to grow and prosper, there were a lot of people here that were out of status um, that were looking over their shoulder constantly every day on every errand they ran or every time they got behind the wheel of a car. And many of them said, you know what? I'm tired of living in the shadows. I'm tired of looking over my shoulder. I'm tired of stressing about all this. I'm going to go home. I'd rather go home and make 65 or 70 percent of what I'd be making in the States and not have to look over my shoulder. And I can be with my family. And I'd rather do that than live in the shadows in the United States. So. It, it, we've seen it work in Mexico, and now we just need to make it work in other countries. Well, and you're right, in twofold. And I think Mexico's still kind of in that category, but along with improving the economy, helping a middle class grow, also need to get those the crime rate and the drugs and the, the cartels under control too because they, they are a significant factor because this whole immigration thing or the, with the coyotes or whatever, I mean, they're making money over it. They're making money hand over fist. As a they banker, are. as a banker, you should know <laughs> uh, that they are. So look at that. Now, when I was in, um, with the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, when Bush was uh, there in office, I actually read a paper that came out of the White House, which I've always advocated for, and um, it, it would work if it could just be implemented in my opinion, is a guest worker program. I mean, we used to have them, a guest worker program where people would come, they would be registered, they'd be vetted, they'd make sure they had clean criminal background, be able to come to the U.S., work, but be able to go back and forth from from job to home when necessary without any scrutiny, without any deportation, without any uh, incarceration. Because a, a lot of people don't realize that if you're up here, let's say you're a young male, you come up, you come to work, you're sending money home, remittance, dollars are going back. And a lot of folks save up to bring their family so they can be with their family. But if they were able to go back and forth and invest those dollars that they earn here into their own country, they could build a much better way of life and start that that middle class. And uh, before long, create start creating and generating some wealth so they too can be on the novelas. I mean, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If you go back to the presidential Republican primary debate in front of the national, um, uh, the League of Women Voters, in and I believe the debate was being held in Iowa, and it was 1980, and there were only two people on stage, and that was Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush. And a question was asked about uh, illegal entries into the United States. And Reagan said, um, yes, maybe we do need a fence, but the, the fence should have a door or a gate where people can come in um, with authorization. And while they're living here and working here, they're paying taxes here. And when they, when they want to go home, they can go back home. And when they want to come back, they can come back as long as they stay within their their status or the time frame that they're being allowed to work. And so this has been, you know, an issue that um, in the 
40s and 50s, during World War II, we called it the Bracero Program. The Bracero Program, yes. And, and it worked. It worked. It had some abuses. Um, some people found ways to, you know, abuse migrants and take advantage of them. And um, But then in the 80s, it was called the Guest Worker Program. And, you know, I think what we've discovered is we found a way how to make it work for the United States, for U.S. employers, and for the migrants themselves. It's, seen, it's a win-win-win situation. We just need Congress to put it in legislation. You're right. And the Bracero program in the 1940s, um, during World War II, when all the men were overseas fighting, they would actually import Mexican nationals to do the jobs. Now, it's interesting that uh, when the soldiers started coming back home and they had this influx of the labor force returning, you have all these these Mexican workers. Now, what do we do with them? I think the president of the United States at the time initiated what's called Operation Wetback and started yeah. these mass roundups of of Mexicans. And it didn't matter whether they're Mexican-American or not. I mean, they're just rounding people up. I know that history shows that a large percentage or a significant amount of people that were rounded up were U.S. citizens, but they didn't care. They just loaded them up into boxcars and sent them to Mexico. So <clears throat> as we're looking at that, there is that abuse there. And even... Here, Eddie, and you know, was better than I do is the recent uh, abuses where people will knowingly hire undocumented folks. They work them, you know, they, they give them hard labor. They work them for two or three weeks and then they call immigration on them so they don't have to pay them. I mean, there's all kinds of abuses happening out there. And I'm not saying we can fix everything, but what can we be done? What can be done or what's being done now to try to mitigate not only some of these atrocities that are going on and, and abuses, but how could we get things back to where we have some sort of comprehensive immigration program? I know the dreamers, we got to start. Uh, that's priority for me. I know is these folks that have known the U S as home that are, were brought here, as you said, um, at a young age, and this is the only place that they know, and you still, and the polls say, I think you said about 80% of the folks in the U.S. poll that, yes, they should stay. But there's still pushback. So wh what's the answer, Eddie? What, what, how, do we get, how do we get through this? I think what we should have is a presidential commission on the future of the workforce. Um, I think we need to take a hard look at who's here now and what kinds of jobs are they doing who do we need and how do we recruit them? Um, you know, JR, as you know, we spend more money on border enforcement than all other federal law enforcement combined. So you, uh, you add up FBI, DEA, ATF, U.S. Marshals, and all the other federal law enforcement uh, agencies, um, um, U.S. Treasury, and you add them all up, and they still don't equal Border Patrol and Customs um, in this wow. country. And so it's not like just throwing money at the problem is going to you know, make it go away. But what we need to do is come to grips with where are the jobs and who wants to fill them. And if we can't find Americans to pick peaches or pick strawberries... Um, because it's 100 degrees outside and you're bent over in the fields all the time, all day long, uh, then we, we have two choices. We can either hire people who are willing to do that kind of work or the industry begins to mechanize and, you know, you do something differently. But it's very difficult. And then what's happened now is because of the shortage of farm workers in the United States, um, you have American companies that are farming in Mexico, and then they export those uh, fruits and vegetables back to the United States. Now, last time I checked, from a homeland security standpoint and a food safety standpoint, um, we shouldn't be growing our crops in other countries and then importing them. It's one thing to buy Mexican corn for our cattle, um, or Canadian wheat um, for our bread mills, that's one thing. But to have American companies 
moving across the border to grow food outside of the U.S. because we can't find labor, that should be an easy problem to solve. But Congress makes everything political and it's hard to get things solved. You're right. It should be an easy problem. I mean, there's plenty of work out there and there's a lot of jobs out there that Americans just don't want, as you said. And then you start talking about, you know, raising minimum wage, which is fine, but there, we're look, I'm looking at this thing and, and I know you are in a lot of ways, taking out the emotion, taking out the, the bigotry, the racism, the stuff that existed and has reared its head here as of late. But just from a sheer business standpoint, it only makes sense. And no matter how you slice it, it comes up the same way is we need an immigrant workforce to be able to sustain this country's economy. I mean, I mean, am well, I wrong? You just, no, you're not. And if you look at the difference between the United States and Canada, um, we spend a lot of our money, time, energy, and resources keeping people out of the country. Canada spends more of its money um, in recruiters who go uh, fan out across the globe finding the people that they need for their economy, whether they're heart surgeons or whether they're nuclear physicists um, or whether they're computer engineers, software engineers. They go recruit those people and bring them in. And that's what we should be doing. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense when people come to the United States, get an education, and then they leave, two things happen, neither of which are in the best interest of the United States. Number one, uh, they serve as an outsourcing center. So they get an American company to outsource work and send it to them in their country. Or number two, um, they go and start a business of their own to compete with an American company. So neither of those in the best interest of the United States. So we should be a little selfish and say, what is in the best interest of the United States? And that's having a workforce that fuels our economy and allows companies to continue to create jobs and, and hire people for those jobs so that we can continue to be uh, the best economy in the freest country in the world. Well, kind of coming full circle, we started off talking about DACA. Now, as you said, there's major corporations out there that fully support a pathway to citizenship for these dreamers because they are essential employees in their in their corporations. I mean, um, I believe that it's Apple companies like Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and even the United States Chamber of Commerce has all endorsed uh, or advocated. Yes, we need to keep these dreamers here. When you have overwhelming support from the public, when you have American business saying we need to do this, why the pushback, Eddie? How, how, come, <laughs> how come the two houses can't get together and go, this is, what, this is what the country needs to survive and sustain itself? This is what the public wants? So what's, what's the problem? Well, in many cases, it's self-preservation. Um, it's a lot easier to fight about something and raise money off of that issue uh, and to keep the problem there so you can continue to raise money and continue to re win re-election than it is to actually solve it and move on to the next issue. I mean, we have so many issues. I had a United States senator tell me about eight years ago. He said, look, you need to lower your expectations because Congress really can't do difficult things. Um <laughs> And it was, uh, it was like, wow. Um, but I think, you know, you, you, whether it's COVID or whether it's, you know, some other 9-11 type event that makes people wake up and say, okay, um, we got to stop this stuff. We got to focus. We got to solve this problem because now we have these other burning issues. And let's just solve the immigration issue and let's move on to these other big ones. And um, you know, it's just one that Congress needs to focus on. Well, there's one thing that I kind of uh, had never thought of. You brought it up a little bit earlier. Let's face it. There's a lot of people that are just scared and they're scared of the fact that their way of life, their, what they've known all their lives is changing. 
they're going, oh my gosh, we're getting more and more Mexicans are coming to this country. Well, as you said, not of them, all of them are Mexicans. They're Guatemalans, they're El Salvadorians, they're, they're from Central America. But at the same time, the non-white Hispanics aren't having babies as much. So they're almost phasing out their own population growth where the only, the only uh, segment that is growing is the Latino community. So it's like, it's, it's kind of this, this scale, this balance. It's like, it's not that there's not too many. It's just that the white, you know, population is starting to diminish. And for the listeners out there real quick, when I, re- when I refer to <clears throat> non-white Hispanics um, or white non-Hispanics, I'm sorry. It's just that if you're Latino, if you're, you're Hispanic in this country, like I am, last name Gonzalez, on my birth certificate, I'm white. And so y- y- Latinos are white in because being Hispanic is not a race. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a designation. Yeah. So we're white. So when you, when you look at that as the non-Hispanic or as the non-Hispanic white population starts to actually shrink in population and the Hispanic population continues to grow. And the fact that if the average age is 27, it's going to, it's going to continue to grow. And I think according to the census, projections, we're going to double one more time in size before we start plateauing off, where the African-American community, they plateaued off decades ago. And uh, if the Latino population was directly responsible for 57% of this country's growth between um, the 2000 and 2010, I too am interested in seeing what these uh, 2020 censuses are going to look like. Yeah, and it's not just the, you know, the the decline of the non-Hispanic you know, white population and the fear of the browning of America. There's a massive cultural shift happening in this country because we're not having children. What you're seeing, there's a great book. If, if you haven't read it, I would encourage your listeners to read it. Um, it's called What to Expect When No One's Expecting. Um, and it's about the declining fertility rate. And trust me, it's more exciting than I'm making it sound because it's not a book just about statistics. But what, the cultural... Eddie, what's the name of that book again? What to Expect When No One Is Expecting. And it's written by Jonathan Last, L-A-S-T. So, um, but one of the things that he talks about in his book is as people stop having children... Uh, the, the, there, he says he can go into a neighborhood and tell you something about the neighborhood just by driving around. If there are more pet stores than there are baby stroller stores, he can tell you what's happening in that neighborhood. And what happens is pet owners, uh, begin to take over the children's playground because there are fewer parents with kids that are at the playground. And before you know it, um, the people with pets believe that that's a dog park now because Mm -hmm. there are so few children there and you get this cultural class phenomenon that is um, cultural clash uh, phenomenon that's taking place. But you see that across the country and it's not just a brown white phenomenon. It's an age issue. It's a child versus non-child, excuse me, a family with children versus a childless couple. Um, And you'll see all sorts of different dynamics that are happening in our country that are all culminating in why we need an immigration system that works. And if you develop that system, people are more likely to follow it. The problem is the system that we have now encourages um, people to enter illegally. And you ask any Border Patrol agent, they'll tell you their greatest fear is chasing down someone who's coming into this country to be a busboy or, uh, uh, you know, a janitor. And while they're busy with them, the real bad guy, the cartel guy is coming in down the road. And so if we solve the problem and, and people can just go to a port of entry and do some of their paperwork there, um, that would make life a lot easier on the border patrol and a lot easier on our economy. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, S- Congressman Cuellar doesn't he have some legislation that that's kind of up there right now in Washington, floating around as far as uh, dealing with dreamers. 
He does, um, and S- as Senator Cornyn has introduced uh, legislation in the past. Um, Senator Cornyn is is talking about uh, the DACA <clears throat> recipients. He understands the issue as well. They both do, and and the beauty is, you know, Henry Quayle is a Democrat, and John Cornyn's a Republican, but they they work very very well together, and um, you know, but they're both obviously from you know. Uh, Today's event, you, the the trip you mentioned, where they went to go visit detention facilities and um, what they're seeing with the surges on the border, they're both concerned because it's difficult to get anything passed when you're in an environment like that. Well, and they're both they're both Texans, and they have a, a different perspective of what's actually going on with this situation. I'm sure they do. they do. The further away you move from the border, um, the more ideological the debate becomes. So. As we start to wind down here, I, I could go on forever. I mean, you're a you're great, great guest to talk to, and I'm sure we could uh, get a bottle of whiskey between us or tequila or whatever and go at it for hours. But Absolutely. Where, where do you see this going, Eddie? Where, what, what do you see? What do you think well, need, needs to happen? Let me put it that way. Well, again, I thought that we were we, – we had a great environment – to be able to make headway. We had public opinion on our side. We have bipartisan support to solve the DACA issue and to get close to having a resolution for um, all the other dreamers. And simply what happened was the push-pull phenomenon um, when people started seeing certain signals or reading between the lines, um, they all started deciding to come this way. And now it's just very difficult to get something done. And I think we're going to have to wait. We were talking about some of the DACA dreamer bills, you know, hitting the floor of the House and the Senate, you know, in April and May. Uh, But now that's, I don't believe that is going to be the case. And so once it dies down um, this summer or this fall, you know, then I think we can uh, perhaps uh, gain some some support, legislative support, congressional support to be able to move these bills forward. I guess the overall environment in the U.S. is tough right now. I mean, we're dealing with the we're talking about the immigration issues, but internally we have our own issues as far as partisan politics, the, <clears throat> the white supremacists, the different groups, and just some of the. I don't even know how to describe it. I mean the fake news, what's real, what's not, what people believe to be real. I'm sure there's going to be folks that disagree with everything that comes out of my mouth, but you know, that's okay. But I think I have a pretty good handle on reality. I I think I may not, I may not for all I know, I'm not even sitting here talking to you, but we have problems of our own in this country. And then added that it's going to be a bumpy ride, Eddie. It's going to be a bumpy ride. It well, and and it it, it kind of almost has has been that way for a while. You know, it's like a little roller coaster, um, and but it's going to be this way for a little bit. And but but as soon as you let your foot off the accelerator, and you 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 can never throw your arms up and say I'm tired of this. You know, you know, let someone else tackle it. You got to keep pushing. You got to keep working. You got to keep the debate going. You have to keep educating people so that when the opportunity comes around and makes itself available, um, that's when you you make your case and you move the bills forward. Absolutely. Just don't give up. Well, Eddie, I want to say this. First of all, thank you for your time and thank, you for, thank you for your leadership. I know this is something that uh, you've been at for decades. Uh and it sounds like you're not going to be giving up and just going to try to see it, see it to the very end. I, I, I'm not, I'm going to keep fighting uh, until we can do this because it's in the best interest of this country. Is there anything you'd like to uh, to say before we sign off? And, and I'd like to see maybe later on, get you back as a guest or maybe get you and the uh, Congressman choir on here so we can talk, talk a little bit deeper into some of these issues, but uh, anything like you, you'd like to say. Well, just, you know, uh, Senator Graham said he wanted to come back down to Texas. Um, In 2011, uh, I started a conversation series in uh, San Antonio, and 
Uh, we've had 18 United States senators come through San Antonio through that process. And uh, Lindsey Graham was the first one. And, um, you know, regardless of what you thought of Lindsey Graham uh, before Trump got elected and after Trump got elected and after Trump left, um, the one thing I will say about Lindsey Graham is he is extremely dedicated uh, to this issue and he wants to see it passed. And um, and I really admire him for that. And so we're going to we're going to keep pushing forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Eddie. And if there's anything that we can do on this end, please let us know. And of course, the efforts that you have in the congressman and anything along the lines of supporting dreamers or resolving this uh, or at least come to some sort of moving forward with uh, a comprehensive immigration program that uh, TAMAC, the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce, uh, stands behind it 100 percent and our resources are available to you. Before we go, one more time, you said the name of that book that we need to read? What to Expect When No One's Expecting by Jonathan Last. Okay. Well, I'm not going to speak for some of the listeners, but uh, is that on audio? Because we are listening to a podcast. I'm not a real big reader when I don't have to. It is most certainly on audio. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll catch it. It's on book. audible.com. It's uh, <laughs> available on your Kindle reader. You can download it different ways. All right. Super. Eddie, thank you very much uh, for being here, Vice President of IBC Bank. You've been listening to the Latino Business Report. My name is J.R. Gonzalez. I'm your host. If, in fact, you like the show, please, we're looking for your comments. Like us, follow us, and uh, go ahead and send us some information. We're always looking for new topics. Thank you very much for joining us.